Good morning, and welcome to Worship at St. Paul. My name is Kimberly Todd, and I'm delighted to worship with you this very special Sunday. This is All Saints Sunday today. And today we hear a reading from the book of Revelation that gives us an image of the saints around the throne in worship and praise. And we hear about that image today and imagine what it is like. I invite you now to settle into worship, to silence any of your distractions, your phone, turn off, whatever noisemakers that you can, and settle into worship today. Welcome to worship today. Today is All Saints Sunday, and it's a day when we remember those who have gone before us in faith, particularly in the last year. And so our bulletin cover lists those who have joined the church triumphant, and we're pretty generous there about sort of who's in our church family. We know that there are many other names, though, that are and people that are on our hearts today as we uh, gather for worship. And we also rejoice with those who are baptized in this year. Uh, again, their children are always welcome in worship. If they're getting so excited, you can take them to the sort of area behind the, the, the glass there. Um, and there's a parade ground there. And also there are busy bags, which you can, and those busy bags can be used in worship. If you're calling in, I invite you to turn down anything in the background. But for all of us, I invite us to take a breath and know that we are in the presence of the living Lord as we worship this morning. Please rise as you are able. We worship in the name in which we baptize, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people. 
turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin. Receive your forgiveness and go into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us pause for reflection as we confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Hear the good news. By grace you have been saved. Out of great love, God sent the beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to die for your sins. And as he lives victorious in the grave, I declare to you that in his name your sins are forgiven. Amen and Alleluia. Our first hymn, our gathering hymn, is For All the Saints, and that is number 422. For All the Saints, we'll sing the first four verses. of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
us pray. Almighty God, you have knit your people together in one communion, in the mystical body of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Grant us grace to follow your blessed saints in lives of faith and commitment, and to know the inexpressible joys you have prepared for those who love you. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. A reading from Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 through 17. The reading is found on page 335 and 336 in the New Testament of your Pew Bibles. After this, I looked, and there was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, robed in white, with palm branches in their hands, they cried out in a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who is seated on the throne, and to the Lamb. All the angels stood around the throne, and around the elders, and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped to God, singing Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might. Be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these, robed in white, and where have they come from? I said to him, Sir, you are the one that knows. Then he said to me, These are they who have come out of the great ordeal. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason they are before the throne of God and worship him day and night within his temple. And one who is seated on the throne will shelter them. They will hunger no more and thirst no more. The sun will not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will guide them to springs of the water of life. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We will read responsively Psalms 149. Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song, his praise in the assembly of the faithful. Let Israel be glad in its maker. Let the children of Zion rejoice in their king. Let them praise his name with dancing, making melody to him with tambourine and lyre. The Lord makes pleasure in his people. He adores and humbles with victory. Let the faithful exult in glory. Let them sing for joy on their couches. Let the high praises of God be in their hearts and to their swords in their hands. To execute vengeance on the nations and punishment on the peoples. To bind their kings with fetters and their nobles with chains of iron. To execute on them the judgment decreed, this is the glory for all his faithful ones. Praise the Lord. Amen. Please rise. According to St. Luke, glory to you, O Lord. Then he looked up at his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. 
Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven. For this is what they did to their ancestors. This is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. But I say to you that listen, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not even withhold your shirt. Give to everyone who begs of you, and if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I want you to be seated, and I think at this point we have our children's message. Very glad that you are. Please come on and gather over in this area. Have a seat here on the floor. It's a really special day, and I'm glad to see so many kids today. Come on up. Come on over. Well, it's a special day today for a couple reasons. One is that it's a day in the church that we call All Saints Sunday. And so today the church has changed. Last week it was red, and this week I see so much white. That's a symbol of the saints that we celebrate today, those who are here, baptized believers, and those who are in heaven. And so we celebrate and remember them today. And today we chose as the really special day to look and dedicate and celebrate and admire and appreciate this new piece of artwork that hangs normally now on the wall above the playground area. I can see it right through the glass. This picture, you might recognize maybe yourself in it, maybe a friend in it, maybe there's a picture that reminds you of somebody. But all the pictures that are here were done by kids in our Sunday school last spring. So you might not even remember, but those of you who were there that Sunday drew a picture of yourself. We gave those pictures to a local artist, and he used them as inspiration for this piece of art. When I look at this piece of art, I see so many colors, and I see so many different beautiful saints. We heard today in Revelation this vision of a great multitude from every tribe and every nation and every language praising God, praising God in heaven. So we hope that this piece of art will remind us of that, that we are all beautiful and called to be together. So what we're going to do, boys and girls, is dedicate this piece of art through a prayer. You do not need to repeat after me. I will say the prayer, but we'll all join our hearts together. And after that, there's another piece for today. Let's do the dedication by joining our hearts in prayer. And let us pray as a congregation. Lord, we lift up this creation of art to you, to your glory. May it inspire those who come into worship to know that they are welcome here. And for those as we all leave this place, to know that we are called to serve in your beautiful and diverse creation. We uplift this to you. In your name we pray. So we're calling this piece of art, Jesus Loves All Children of the World. So we have our youngest Sunday school classes that are going to sing for us that song and in praise to God. So Miss Kate, who leads you every week in song when you gather for Sunday school, is here to get you ready. I'll move out of the way so that you singers can be up here.
boys and girls, now before you go back to your seats, we have some things for you. Of course, we have the children's bulletin, which today is printed on white paper, but we also have for each of you a copy of the artwork. This is a card you can use and send it like a postcard. And to the whole congregation, we have these cards available for you to take and leave a free will donation for them. And they're in the narthex on the table. So before you go back to your seat, how about if I give Miss Kate the children's bulletin? So if you'd like one of those, you can take one from her. And everyone come and take a card as you go back to your seat. Just as they're heading back, I'll just say that the, we have a lot of special music today, and actually for the hymn after the sermon, you can stay seated for that. Is heaven for real? Is heaven for real? That's the question that I want us to ask ourselves today. I think it's a question that we often find ourselves asking, especially on a day like today when we're reminded of our mortality, but in which we remember the mortality of those who have gone before us in faith, wondering really, is there some place, some time, some space, some relationship where all things have been made right and where those who have died, that somehow they're there and at peace? So again, this is what I want us to reflect on today, is heaven for for real. And we have a vision, a beautiful vision of heaven from the book of Revelation today. And, and sometimes Revelation has all these symbols and numbers, and so it can seem cryptic. But I want us to sort of then un unpack it and really kind of wrestle with this vision in the seventh chapter of Revelation about what heaven is like. Because I think the more that we wrestle with it, the more that we're going to study it and play with it and ponder it, the more it's going to become clear that this vision that, that we hear today, this vision recorded in, in Revelation, is so counterintuitive, so countercultural to every culture that has ever existed. It is just not the, the sort of the, the fantasy wish list of any person or any culture at any time that it's so mind-blowing, so much more big and beautiful than anything that anybody could have ever thought of, that it, it has to be true. Again, I want to I wanna wrestle it and sort of reveal the authenticity as we realize that this could not have come from a, a human mind, that there was a divine inspiration here in, in this vision for, for what heaven looks like. And the way I want to uh, get at that at, at first is to, to consider that one of the sort of the, the problems, one of the, the challenges with religion, and this is any time, any culture, any place, is that religion often boils down to my God, my tribe is better than your God and your tribe, right? This is sort of a, a fundamental religious tendency. My God, my tribe is better than your God, your tribe. And we see this playing itself out in our world still today. In fact, the, the Archbishop of the Russian Orthodox Church, which is its own crazy story how he got this position. But anyway, he has declared that, that Russian soldiers that, that die in the battle in the war against Ukraine will, will have their sins forgiven. Again, this sixth sense of where my nation, my tribe, my God are righteous and yours are not. And this also permeates even parts of the Old Testament. In fact, the, the psalm that we, we read today kind of has that second part where you're kind of like, whoa. Again, there's a real sense of my God, my tribe is better than your God and your tribe. In fact, after the resurrection, one of the questions that the disciples ask Jesus is, is this now the time for you to restore the kingdom to Israel? Again, this thought permeates 
the Old Testament, parts of the New Testament, because it permeates every human psyche. My tribe, my gods, my people are better than yours. And actually, in the book of Revelation, the the first part, I want to read a little bit before what we had today. The first part of it would fulfill that kind of thinking. Because this is what the seer originally saw. He said, I saw 144,000 sealed out of every tribe of Israel, from the tribe of Judah, 12,000, from the tribe of Reuben, 12,000, from the tribe of Gad, 12,000, and so forth. All the tribes listed, 12,000. And for the sort of the first century Jewish mind, this is great. All 12 tribes, 12 is a holy number, and there's 12,000, and 1,000 is three tens, and three and ten are holy, and this is all the elect finally gathered, and God is restoring the kingdom to Israel, and all the tribes, the faithful remnant is there together. But it turns out that this vision of heaven is not of human origin. There's something bigger and more beautiful here. And the seer looks up, and he says, and I then saw... I then saw a number that could not be counted from every nation, every tribe, and every language. This is somebody who's now realizing that God is bigger than their own tribe. And you think about, again, the the, the Old Testament images permeate. This definitely is a, a person coming out of a first century Jewish mindset, yet here it is, God is bigger and that's something again that just every culture and every tribe there nope heaven is way bigger than any tribe any nation any people but if you were to if we really were to sort of slow this down and and we said and we paid attention and said and i i looked up and there was this great multitude that no one could count from every nation from all the tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne if i stopped there that's a sentence that would have made sense to somebody living in the roman empire Because the Roman Empire, you see, brought everybody together. All the different tribes all around sort of the the civilized world were brought under Roman military control. And of course there was a throne. And on that throne sat none other than Pontifus Maximus, the great emperor of Rome. And he brought everybody together under his iron rule. And it was that the center of the Roman universe was about power, the power to oppress, the power to wage war, to divide and conquer and to win. But what do we get here in the book of Revelation? What happens when we finally hear about all these nations gathered by a throne? Here's what we have. Standing before the throne and before the Lamb. Before the Lamb. Could you think of a more pathetic, militaristic animal than a lamb? How about a lion, an elephant, a panther, anything? But a lamb, not even a ram, not even a goat, a lamb. You know, the kind that can't defend themselves. They can barely even bawl loud enough. And once a year, they're shorn of all their wool, and they look so pathetic. It turns out that the center of the cosmos, the, the center of the heavens... The power source is no longer going to be military might or hatred or revenge. Something else is actually holding the cosmos together. And who is this lamb? Well, okay, now I'm going to do a little bit of unpacking of Revelation symbolism. The lamb is Jesus Christ. We hear in the Bible, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And we even hear about how this lamb's blood is shed. You see, the lamb here at the center is Christ. What happens is is that God chooses to redo the cosmos, and instead of the world being held together by power and military and oppression, the world is going to be held together by Christ who comes and offers himself for us dying on a cross. The cross becomes the center. The power now flows out, not of hatred, not of oppression, not of division. The power flows out of sacrificial love. Again, God has redone the world so that the heart, the center, the gravity of the universe is now the love of God in Jesus Christ. And what that means is that all these divisions that plague us as humans that have produced wars and conflict and boundaries, suddenly, suddenly they're they're this way in which we're all brought together. And then there becomes 
Wow, look at this. Instead of shields and swords, people are just there dressed in a simple white robe. And there's, there's no weapons, there's no guns, there's no ammo in our hands anymore. There's just a palm branch for praising God. That's it. And then we join together and we have this beautiful song, this song that's in all the languages of the world. Salvation belongs to our God and to Christ the Lamb forever. And so now we realize that our beloved, those who have gone before us in faith, that they have joined. They've joined this, this triumphal song. And they're getting to hear it in all the languages with all of creation, praising the Lamb, praising Christ in the center as they behold that the center of the universe is now love. Wow. So, but, you know, you think about this and, and this vision of heaven, it, it's not something that just sort of automatically grows out of a Jewish mind or a Roman mind. There's, there's something else. There's another origin of it. But I think if we're, we're honest, we begin to realize that it, it also goes against some of our own thoughts about what heaven is like. Again, this is a vision that, that transcends all cultures and all times. It was the Greeks, in many ways, who introduced the idea of an afterlife of reward and punishment. But this idea, again, that the afterlife is basically a reward and punishment permeates all sorts of cultures. Right? The Vikings, right? Your reward for being a good warrior was you got to drink with your friend's mead forever in the halls with Odin. Or we all know sort of the the fantasies that become the jihadist and Islamist fighters and their sense of the rewards that were wait for them. Again, there's this powerful sense of reward that we finally in heaven get to fulfill our fantasies, get to do what we want to do, and of course with 21-year-old bodies. And most of us being sort of middle class, we're not interested in drinking mead, but probably something like golfing and gardening or baking cookies, right? Again, but again, we have this sense we finally get to do what we want to do unencumbered by a body. But at the center, at the center of the vision of heaven in, in Revelation, and in fact, in the center of it all, is, is something different. I think when I hear many people talk again about heaven, what's conspicuously absent in, in the descriptions of heaven that I hear, and, and makes me think that they're more pagan than, than Christian, is that when people talk about heaven, I'm, I'm overwhelmed by how rarely we actually talk about Jesus. And that our descriptions of heaven are all about us getting to do what we wanted to do in this life. And that's not really what, again, heaven is about. Heaven is not the fulfillment of our fantasies. Heaven is the fulfillment of our righteousness. Again, heaven is not the fulfillment of our fantasies. Heaven is the fulfillment of our righteousness. And you see, there we actually worship Christ. It's about Christ at the center. But then Christ does something else, and we hear in this beautiful passage that Christ was once the lamb who was slain for us, now is the shepherd who tends to us. In fact, we hear this beautiful promise that finally the tears will be wiped away from our own eyes, and we realize that we are the beloved. So, so what's happening in heaven? What do we get to do? I don't know all of those things, but I, I know that, that those who have gone before us are now the beloved. And they're having that right relationship where they can do nothing else but praise the Lord and yet be ministered to and receive the love of God. And that this right relationship, of course, means now that we finally have right relationship with each other. And the strain and toil and weariness and sins we have committed on each other are suddenly no more. And again, there is this peace between us and all peoples. And even in our own bodies, the bodies that gave out, the bodies that suffer addiction, that suffer cancer, that suffer heart attacks. Finally, we have this new body, right? We can, we can stand, and I, and I think about the people who their whole life were so weakened at the end by their disease. They're, they're upright, and they're holding the palm branch, and they're finally able to sing with full voice and praise to the Creator. So is heaven for real? I would humbly offer that a lot of our sense of heaven probably isn't right. Turns out that heaven again and again transcends any human, any culture's expectations of it. But what we do know is real is that God intends for all things to be made right and has done so in Jesus Christ. 
that God intends for there to be a place and a space where finally we can have the peace that passes all understanding. We can have the joy and we can have the righteousness and live under him forever. Amen. Let us profess our faith with the reciting of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, 
the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Friends in Christ, let us pray in communion with all the saints on earth and heaven, with the martyrs and the faithful in all ages, and in the name of the Lamb who was slain, who alone is worthy of worship. We bring before you, gracious God, all our needs, trusting that you will receive them as we pray. Lord, in your mercy. God of saints and sinners, make your church a holy church, a praying church, a giving church, a serving church. Bring to our attention the saints who finished their pilgrimage on earth as good and faithful servants, that they may be for us examples of what it means to live rooted and growing in Christ. On this day, we especially remember Jeanette Ehlers, Jim Brenner, Evelyn Balmer, Richard Ditzler, Joan Filer, Herbert Fry, Melvin Herr, Mitchell Kettner, Tom Kreck, John Leckie, Michael Mahoney, Ron McIntyre, Glenn Miller, Bob Ulrich, Marion Weber, and Paula Weigand. Lord, in your mercy, God of righteousness, through your sacramental gift of holy baptism, we die to sin and rise to new life in Christ. Thank you for adopting these persons and placing upon their lives the seal of the Holy Spirit and the sign of the cross. Jace Billow, Connie Buck, Ava Gusenhauser, Harrison Myers, Max and Nicholas Ruckenberg, and Basil Todd. Lord, in your mercy. God of justice, fill our public servants and those whom we elect to office on Tuesday with your wisdom. Let your justice freely flow through each branch of our government and all related institutions. Lord, in your mercy. God of mercy, Accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Take a moment and give to the sign of God's peace. Okay, I invite us to be seated for a few brief announcements. Again, uh, we're a special word of welcome to visitors. I invite you to fill one of the visitors cards. If you're worshiping with us online, welcome. Uh, for those who's, uh, who have family members who have entered into the church triumphant or were baptized, um, you can take one of the flowers with you uh, after worship. Also. Again, there's more information about, and there's the postcards for the art in the, in the narthex in the lobby after worship. But I think the biggest thing on our calendar today uh, really is what's going to happen tonight, and that's the Empty Bowls, a really significant uh, fundraiser we do in the community to bring people together. I thank John McCormick and the team of volunteers she has led for that. Uh, the upcoming weekends, there's a couple things already. Next Sunday, we have some stuff going on. I invite you to uh, take a look and, and read more about it. I also thank everyone who has been uh, generous in their, making their pledges, both for the capital campaign, for the roof and solar panels, as well as for the regular offering. That allows us to move ahead, uh, confident in, in how we can continue to do the mission that God has called us to here. With this, I invite us all to rise as we present our gifts.
gracious God, in your great love, you richly provide for our needs. Make of these gifts a banquet of blessing and make us ready to share with all in need. Through Jesus Christ, who sets the table for all. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift, lift them to the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It, it is, is right, right to give our, our thanks and praise. It is indeed our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, through Christ. So the church on earth and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. saying, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again after supper he took the cup, and after he had given thanks, he gave it to all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as we do this, we proclaim the great mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died, Christ, Christ is, is risen, risen. Christ, Christ will come, come again. again. And in that great hope, we pray as our Savior taught us. Our God, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. table is ready. You may be seated. Ushers will invite you. The first chalice will have wine. There's also grape juice. And there are also gluten-free wafers available upon request. But then I looked up and saw the way God intends it to be. All people brought together by their praise and song before the Lamb. And Jesus comes to us as our shepherd and guides us all the way from here in this life to life everlasting. I invite you, if you would like to receive a pastoral visit or receive communion at your home, to get in touch with the church office or with Pastor Robert Wallace, whose email you see on our screen. We would be delighted to talk with you more about what you've heard today, questions that you have, or share with you the communion table. And now as we go into our weeks, may God bless you and God keep you. God make God's face shine upon you and give you God's peace. Amen. <laughs>